First, I want to just apologize if you can hear the lawnmower that's right outside my window. So I hope you can hear me. Good afternoon. Thank you all for being with us today. I am Lisa Roberts, and I'm honored to serve as the president of the Westchester Jewish Council, which proudly serves as the central communicating, convening, and connecting organization for Westchester Jewry. Since 1975, we have worked closely with our 130 plus member organizations, including synagogues and agencies, which in turn serve the Jewish community of Westchester of nearly 150,000 Jews. The council's sole purpose is to connect the Jewish community of Westchester, to strengthen our Jewish community, and we all benefit from the work done by our dedicated staff, officers and board members in the areas of security, government relations, connecting Jews to Israel, to other ethnic and faith-based groups, and to the broader community, and by working with our member organizations across the county to help them better engage Westchester Jewry. One of the important ways the council works to connect our community is by partnering with various mission aligned organizations that offer valuable resources to our broad and diverse community. The Jewish Grandparents Network, which seeks to recognize and celebrate the unique and essential role of grandparents in today's Jewish family is just such an organization. We are excited to introduce them to you today. Understanding the unique role of grandparents will greatly benefit you as you explore new resources and our member organizations by helping to create a path that encourages meaningful engagement of this demographic and their families in Jewish life. Just a program note, all attendees will be muted. And at the conclusion of our speaker's presentation, we will open the conversation up to questions or comments from all of you. If you have a question or comment, please post it in the chat box and we will do our best to get to as many of your questions as time allows. Now it is my pleasure to introduce Sheila Freeland, who previously served as the executive director and then later as a board member of the Westchester Jewish Council to tell us a little more about her involvement with the Jewish Grandparents Network and to, in, to introduce our speaker today. Thanks, Lisa. You know, when the rollout for the COVID vaccine began a couple of months ago, I was struck by how many TV announcers kept saying, grandparents will get to hug their grandchildren. Grandparents will get to hug their grandchildren. These announcers uh, were zoning in on the needs and longings of a huge percentage of the population, grandparents. It's a privilege to be a grandparent. And indeed in our prayers, we say, may you live to see your children's children. And yet, as I think back on Jewish community, we have not really addressed this cohort in an immersive way. Yes, we have lots of senior programming, but I think that Lee Hendler and David Raphael, the co-founders of the Jewish Grandparents Network, have honed into something that will benefit families, communities, and the future of Jewish life. It takes enormous guts and courage and vision to create a new national organization and to do so in a comprehensive way. They realize that there's tremendous complexity in contemporary Jewish family life today. And I, for one, think it's wonderful to have a resource that can enrich and inform family relationships. David and Lee have done exactly that and we're privileged to hear about their journey and findings from David today. Before I turn the program over to David, let me tell you a bit about him. I'm obviously greatly abridging his resume. David Raphael has spent virtually his entire professional career in Jewish communal service. He spent 30 years in Hillel including such roles as Assistant International Director of the organization. He was also the founding executive director of the Floor Time Foundation, an organization seeking to advance new approaches in treating children on the autism spectrum. David and his wife, Jo, live in Atlanta. They have three grown children and they're blessed with a granddaughter named Bina who calls David Zadie. God willing, David and Joe will be grandparents to a second grandchild next month. 
It's my privilege now to turn the meeting over to David for his presentation. Um, thank you. Um, do I get to be spotlighted? I guess I'll have to pretend. Um, so I do want to add just briefly to my bio is that I'm a New York boy. Um, I was uh, born and raised in Bayside, or actually born in Brooklyn, raised in Bayside. Um, and I find myself here in Atlanta, and I keep on expecting it to say like white plains on the highway, and it says Chatta, you know, Chattahoochee or whatever. And I'm going, where could I be? But I will say that uh, two out of three of my sisters live in Westchester. And so you probably know, you may know Eve Spence, who's one of my sisters, and Susan Kernick is uh, the other, and one is nicer than the other. So um, I'm delighted to be here. This is, I think, the largest cohort of folks I've spoken to since my bar mitzvah. So after I finish my presentation, I'm going to do my haftorah, which I still remember. Okay, so we're going to focus uh, today on the first national study of Jewish grandparents, which we think provides some incredibly valuable guidance uh, for professionals, communities, and organizations to think about how to better connect with and engage grandparents. Uh, time permitting, I've added um, two or three additional slides. We did some uh, follow-up research during COVID, um, and we have some data regarding grandparents' role during COVID, which we think builds on um, the important um, understanding that we have on the role of grandparents and families. So why don't we go to the next slide, please? Okay, that's us. We are the only organization, at least the first organization, that seeks to uh, support grandparents as they embrace traditional and radically new roles in their families. I don't need to tell you that the kind of the dynamics of Jewish family life has changed significantly over the yes, last years and grandparents are adopting to that. Um, we have focused on uh, research, advocacy, institutional partnerships, and new initiatives that we're creating. So essentially our role is to advance grandparents' role as essential members of today's families and transmitters of Jewish values, customs, and traditions. Next. So um, it, we started our first national study of Jewish grandparents on, um, in November, 2018. Our goal was to get a, um, quantifiable data that could be extrapolated to the broader community uh, of grandparents in America, in actually in the United States. Uh, Canada wasn't included. Um, we had two cohorts that we worked with. One was a national representative sample of over a thousand uh, grandparents. Um, and those were uh, gathered by a national sampling organization. And the other was we worked with 17 national and local organizations to create an outreach sample cohort. These are folks who self-identified and because of that, we can't say that they were randomly sampled. They chose to be involved and it's interesting comparing those groups. Uh, the first finding of our group is that, of the study was that people were really interested in what we were doing because close to 7,000 grandparents filled out the survey um, who chose to. Okay, next slide please. So the uh, survey was online, it was about 20 minutes. We focused on grandparents ages 55 to 80 because we wanted to target for this study, uh, grandparents relationship with the younger uh, grandkids. They had to self-identify as Jewish, um, had to live in the United States and have a one least grand, one grandchild living under the age of 18. We looked at uh, demographics, attitudes and beliefs needs and behaviors. And because an important part of the study was to explore the relationship between a grandparent and a grandchild, we targeted one grandparent to, uh, randomly for each participant in the study to do a deep dive. That's to say we had the grandparent list the initials of all their grandkids. Uh, and then the survey instrument randomly selected one grandchild to focus on. Uh, grandparents complained to us, why did you choose this child? It's my least favorite child. I like my other grandchild better, or this one's too young. And by random sampling was the only way that we could get data 
that we could extrapolate to the broader community. So move on, please. Next slide. Okay. So, so just real quickly, some demographic data. Next slide. So the grandparents that we studied were basically between the ages of 65 and 74. So you see about 65% of these grandparents were between that age. Um, uh, could you go back, please? Um, I think in terms of the denominational affiliation, I think it kind of breaks down similarly to the Pew study. And additionally, we found that about 80, 79% of our grandparents were currently married or living with a partner and 10% were widowed and 11% were divorced or separated. Next, please. Um, by and large, uh, the grandparents we studied and therefore Jewish grandparents in America, half of them have revenue over annual income of over $100,000 a year and about a third of them, 30% give or take, have revenue over $150,000 a year, which makes it higher than the broader sample of uh, grandparents or adults this age in America. So um, grandparents by and large have some resources uh, that are available to spend. Two thirds of the grandparents we studied were retired. Okay, next please. Um, our grandparents had one or two grandkids basically. So you have about what? 70% of grandparents we studied have one or two children. Um, the majority, about 55%, had one or two grandkids. Um, and that obviously would be different in different cohorts in the community. Um, and an important finding was we found that 47% of grandparents live within an hour by car, bus, or train uh, of their grandkids or, or the grandkids selected in the study. That's important because if you're an organization, synagogue or JCC, and you're thinking about uh, engaging grandparents in grandparent, grandchildren activity, half of our grandparents have grandkids live close by. Conversely, another 40%, 39% live more than uh, five hours away by car, bus or train uh, than their grand to their grandkids. And, you know, that's complicated in a place like Westchester, you could say, well, I live an hour from my grandkid who lives in Nassau County, that's still a schlep. And so that's something to think about. Okay, please next. Um, so we found that 53% um, of grandparents reported that at least one of their grandkids is being raised in a multi-faith uh, household. Uh, and where one of their parents does not identify as Jewish. And on the left, you see how um, uh, the faith-based traditions in which the children are being raised as reported by grandparents, 15% Jewish, 23% uh, uh, Jewish in another faith, and you can go down, 30% in no faith and 20% in another faith only. That's an important statistic to think about in terms of what are the opportunities to engage uh, children who are being raised in multi-faith families in a Jewish life that's innovative and meaningful um, and a value. When we did uh, focus groups with parents, when we asked them how the kids are grant the kids are going to be raised, what will be the ident religious identity of their kids, many of them told us we're figuring that out. It's kind of an ad hoc quality. We're not quite sure. We'll see where it ends up. Therefore, there's a sense that we have that there is the possibility of engaging kids being raised in multifamilies in um, meaningful Jewish life that they can embrace. Next, please. Okay, next, or not. Excellent. Um, okay, so we asked grandparents whether they were invested in passing on their Jewish identity to their grandkids. And on a very high level, across the board, grand, Jewish grandparents want to pass on their Jewish identity to their grandkids. Now, again, this is a random sample. These are not the folks from, you know, in your shul or your JCCs every day. Across the board, 71% of Jewish grandparents say it's important to me to transmit Jewish values. 70% say it's important to me to teach my grandkids about their Jewish heritage. 64 and 63%, I want my grandchild to have a strong connection to Judaism, and I want my grandchild to be interested in Jew doing Jewish act activities. So the motivation across the board is there for grandparents to be actively involved in promoting the Jewish identity of their grandkids. 
Interestingly, only 38% said it is important for them that their grandchild marries a Jewish partner. A lot of ways of interpreting that. One way may be grandparents recognize that that train has left the station or whatever the euphemism that you use is that that is the reality of uh, Jewish life in America today. Next, please. We ask grandparents the kind of stuff that they did with their grandkids. And what we see in the past year is that by and large, grandparents are doing far more secular activities than they are Jewish activities. The things that they did the most were birthdays and stuff both at their grandchildren's homes and at their homes. And so part of what we say when it comes to connecting grandparents and grandkids, the home is where it's at. That is where the real opportunities to create are to create meaningful opportunities to bring together grandparents and grandkids. You see on the secular side, how the numbers drop, visiting family attractions, doing stuff, attending performances. And then on the right side, the numbers are far lower when it comes to um, grandparent engagement with their grandkids in Jewish activities. 26% of synagogues and temples down to 13%, for instance, at programs at JCCs. Um, next, please. Okay, so we worked, so let's stay here for a minute. So we worked with a, um, a researcher who had done a lot of work in the marketing sphere. Uh, go, and we wanted to get a sense of how we think about the different segments of the grandparent population. And we did what's called the segmentation analysis. And we took 31 questions. And we used, based on those questions, use an algorithm to identify five different cohorts within the grandparent population. Why is that important? Because as organizations, it gives you the opportunity to direct your um, activities and experiences and engagement based on the profiles of those different um, uh, uh, cohorts. So let's look at the next slide. So the five cohorts are, and you'll see they're fairly evenly broken down, are joyful at 20%, faithful at the smallest, which is 60%, secular is the largest, wistful is 20%, and detached is 21%. So let's look at them in greater depth. Next, please. So I actually have a t-shirt that says joyful parent, grandparent, and that represents about one out of every five grandparents. These are folks who love being grandparents. They love being part of a multi-generational family. They feel it's important for them to transmit Jewish values. And importantly, they model those behaviors. And that's a really important dynamic. They model those behaviors for their grandkids. About 65% um, of them are synagogue, synagogue goers. And two thirds of their adult kids are married to Jewish partners. So that's joyful. Grandparents are 20%. Next, please. So faithful grandparents are like um, joyful, but they tick up higher in terms of their intentionality of passing on Jewish traditions. They talk more strongly about wanting their grandkids to have a strong connection to Judaism and to marry kids. They're deeply involved with their grandkids and they're again, on a higher level, more intentionally modeling and promoting Jewish behavior. So for instance, they have the highest percentage of synagogue goers and we see that three quarters of their grand of their grandkids, uh, of their kids, are have married Jewish partners. And by the way, we see generationally, their kids are following in terms of their, let's say, participation in Jewish life, specifically in terms, let's say, in synagogue uh, attendance. So the next group, next please, is a secular grandparents, and that this doesn't mean we struggle with finding a name for this. Um, it doesn't mean that they don't believe in God. It means that by and large, they like being grandparents. They have enjoy being grandparents. They like being part of a multi-generational uh, family, but by and large, they're not actively modeling Jewish faith practices for their grandkids. So they significantly less likely to describe themselves as religious or spiritual. So they're not modeling those, those behaviors. That doesn't mean that they may not be connected, let's say, to a federation or a JCC, but on a daily basis, in the way that we define activism in Jewish life, they're not modeling those behaviors. So, for instance, 
21% are synagogue goers, and two thirds of their children have chosen partners who are not Jewish. Now, part of what we've discovered about this cohort, and it's worthwhile for organizations to think about is many of these folks might not have the backgrounds and experiences to thoughtfully model um, Jewish behaviors um, for their grandkids. So we use a term called a Maxwell House Haggadah, you know, um, Jews. That is to say, they know they're supposed to do a, a, a Seder, but they may not have the, the sense of confidence to make the Seder their own and to bring it their own. So many of them lack the background to effectively model those behaviors. And that's an interesting dynamic for our community, a cohort for our communities to think about. Next, please. Wistful grandparents want to be more involved uh, in the lives of their grandkids, but family dynamics get in the way. So they may have significantly uh, less likely to have uh, uh, interacted with their grandkids. They may have differences with their grown children about child rearing. And that's 20% of our population. One out of every five grandparents speaks of being a wistful grandparent. And we've discovered in our conversations that this can range from you know, I don't like the way my daughter-in-law is toilet training. My grandkids have some really profound, painful, multi-generational breakdowns in relationship. Uh, and I think this is a community that, um, a cohort that Jewish family services and maybe synagogues could think about how we engage and respond to their sadness often about not being able to be with their grandkids. Uh, next, please. <coughs> So detached grandparents may be older, and we also see that by and large, they're, they're not really transmitting Jewish values in any way. Um, they're not really, they're only like 14% are synagogue uh, goers. They're most likely to um, have um, um, non-Jewish partners of their own and most not likely to have children who are married um, to uh, uh, non-Jewish partners. So basically they're not engaged Jewishly or passing on uh, those beliefs and practices to their grandkids. When we think about creating those concentric circles of and how we think about outreach on our community, this may be a cohort that may not be worth kind of, um, then this may not be a good use of our resources to try to engage them. So that's 21%, uh, one fifth. Uh, next please. So I wanted to show you, you remember we talked about the two different samples, the outreach sample, which folks who self-selected and the representative sample. These are folks who are uh, in a random sample um, and represent in a very high level, 95% level Jewish grandparents across America. So you look at the bottom, the outreach sample, and you'll see that those folks who are most likely to be involved in our organizations, joyful and grateful, uh, joyful and faithful grandparents represent three quarters of the outreach sample. So we did outreach with 17 partner organizations. We had a big ad or a big article in eJewish Philanthropy. And those grandparents who self-selected were primarily those folks who were connected to Jewish life. And so those are the folks we think we can uh, kind of with some confidence say, we see on a regular basis on, in our communities. Conversely, when we look at the representative sample, only 36% of them are joyful and faithful. Uh, and therefore we guess that somewhere in the area of 65% of grandparents may not be actively connected uh, to our communities. And part of our uh, kind of shared work is to think about how we kind of extend that number. How do we engage those secular grandparents to we can increase the number of folks who we're connecting with? Uh, next, please. Um, so we did some analysis based on these findings. So one of the questions we asked grandparents is how interested are you in passing on con these concepts and practices in to your grandkids? And we broke them down by segment. And you see, I'm, I'm point, you can't see my pointer, but you know, um, Joyful in the orange, blue is uh, faithful, green is secular, kind of brown, it was the maroon is wistful and yellowish mustard is detached. And you see across the board on the far left, 
that just about every grandparent wants their grandkids to kind of lead ethical and moral lives. And on a very high level, they also want them to know their family stories, uh, which we found quite interesting. Interesting as well is that across the board, although it does diminish pretty significantly with detached Jews, grandparents want to teach their grandkids about the Holocaust. But here's what I found interesting, is that if you go to the far right, where it says donating to stock, uh, charities, stock, uh, and volunteering to make the world a better place, the number of grandparents who are invested in sharing those values with their grandkids drops fairly precipitously, especially in related to leading a moral and ethical life. So across the board, about 81, 82% of grandparents say that they're invested in their grandkids leading an ethical and moral life. But when it comes to um, donating staka, that number is only about 41, 42%, and volunteering to make the world a better place, about 50% across the board, and dropping the secular, wistful, and detached, which in my mind kind of demonstrates that kind of a lacuna or a gap between the understanding that donating and staka and val and tikkun olam are essential elements. It's how we define leading an ethical and moral life. And so there's a disconnect there worth thinking about. Next, <clears throat> just some other things we looked at, the things that they're in, uh, interested in. Um, and you can see how each one of these drops fairly precipitously when you go from joyful and faithful down to uh, detached. Um, so over you know, 80%, 90% of joyful and grateful fan, uh, Faithful grandparents say it's important that their grandkids are familiar with Jewish customs and traditions. That number is about what, 12, 13% for our detached. So you see how those, how those kind of um, segments begin to frame uh, kind of specific issues. Um, you know, uh, celebrating Jewish and holidays, very, very high when it comes to um, faithful and joyful. And when it comes down to um, secular um, and wistful and detached, those numbers uh, um, drop pretty precipitously. A couple of interesting things, you look at the numbers when it comes to a connection to the state of Israel, even among um, joyful and faithful, these numbers are only about what, 58 and 60% across the board. It's about 30% and celebrating Shabbat it's also fairly low across the board, which is, I find, both interesting and disturbing. And I added two slides, uh, which kind of fleshed that out a little more. Um, so uh, next, please. Um, we asked them, <clears throat> now this specifically speaks of a grandparent's involvement in Jewish life. This is not the, the relationship between grandparents and grandkids. We asked grandparents, are you currently a member or regular participant of any of these? And you see that the numbers of synagogue and minyan uh, involvement is fairly high, certainly among um, joyful and faithful, as you see it drops pretty significantly when it comes to secular and about 40% of our wistful um, grandparents. And I think, you know, for my generation, um, and I want to compare that, for instance, with Jewish community center membership, which is across the board fairly low. I don't know, you know, I'm speculating that for my generation, my synagogue, Jewish Center of Bayside Oaks, was my Jewish center. That's where I hung out, that's where I played basketball. So, you know, we wonder if it's a genera generational thing in terms of grandparents' connection to JCCs and synagogues, but I think those numbers are fairly striking and we've shared those with the Jewish uh, JCCA Association. Next, please. So these are my slides. You can see that they're not well as well made, but I think they work. So we asked, how often have you attended synagogue services with your grandkids? And again, you see across the board, total, joyful, faithful, secular, wistful, and detached. And you know, pretty much across the board, um, although faithful, it's about what, about 50% say uh, less than once a month, but by and large, grandparents are not attending synagogue services with their grandkids on a regular basis a lot. The blue line represents how often that they, you know, that they're saying that they haven't done it in the past year. 
even among the joyful, it's about 58%. Across the board, it's about 75%. And see how it's much higher among um, secular, wistful, and detached Jews. Now, let's remember that about 40% of grandparents live uh, five hours or more away from their grandkids, but still, that's kind of surprising numbers. Next slide, please. Shabbat services are not so different. Um, certainly, faith, faithful grandparents are celebrating Shabbat um, with their grandkids at about 50% level, um, or joyful uh, about once a month um, for actually less than once a month for joyful. But you see the numbers of participation. This is once a month two or three times a month. So the, you'll see, that's the, um, I don't know if you could read the slide, but by and large, it shows you that grandparents are not celebrating Shabbat uh, with their grandkids. Now we didn't ask whether they were celebrating Shabbat virtually or in person. This is before COVID, so we could assume that they, they meant you know, in person. So I, I think synagogues, and shuls in our communities and to think about the role of Shabbat and synagogues in the lives of our family and how we elevate that. Next, please. And just some other um, slides in terms of the kind of things they do together. Just to go through this real quickly, you see that the numbers of doing stuff at your grandkids' home and at grandparents' home are all very, very high across the board. That's where we think the action is. Obviously, reading is pretty high. And God bless PJ Library, who's done such magnificent work. One of the slides, uh, one of the statistics that we want to show is on the far right that talks about the role that grandparents play as child providing childcare on a schedule uh, or as needed basis. And across the board, that's about a third of grandparents report that they're providing childcare services on a regular basis. And if you take that specifically in, in terms of the grandparents who live within an hour, that number is closer to half. Half of grandparents are providing childcare with, to their grandkids on a scheduled and on a needed basis. The number is consistently high when we ask whether they're providing overnight childcare and whether they're providing transportation services. About half of grandparents are providing those services to their kids who live close by on a regular basis which talks about the important role that grandparents play in the daily lives of their grandkids. Next. Oh, okay, just some other statistics real quickly. You see that Hanukkah is very, very high in terms of celebration. And on the far right, you see that attending high holiday services by and large, not something that they've done with grandkids. The question was in the last three years, which of these activities have done with your have you done it with your grandkid? And you see that that number is relatively low. Sorry about that. Next, please. So what does this mean for our communities? So I, I think what we're saying is in looking at the different segments, um, in terms of engaging joyful and faithful, I think these are folks we're seeing, and many of you I know, I've spoken to many synagogues, are doing incredibly creative things to engage grandparents and their grandkids. I think they're open to experiences in JCCs and in synagogues, uh, and you should continue to explore creative uh, approaches. Uh, I think one of the things that we, uh, one of the things we strongly recommend across the board is to think about how you can bridge the institution to home-based experiences. So it's great when grandparents and grandkids come, let's say, to Shabbat, Sh 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 and many uh, synagogues do some wonderful work in that regard. How do we help grandparents and grandkids, let's say, celebrate Shabbat at home or other holidays at home? Uh, in terms of secular grandparents, the cohort that pro probably provides the greatest opportunity for growth is we're saying two things. How do you create a Jewish element to secular celebrations, to a birthday, to Thanksgiving, and those kind of things. Um, again, how do you bring Judaism into the home? And how do we explore non-Jewish spaces? How do we make it not only about getting them to come to our shul, but maybe to meet at a stream for um, Tashlich, or to meet in the field for Havdalah, but to really to be creative and thinking about how we can extend what it means 
to connect with our Jewish uh, community. In terms of our wistful grandparents, um, how do we help them? How do we help them in navigating complex family dynamics that are getting more complex um, as the years go on? How do we think about using technology? And one of the things that a lot of communities have done that is incredibly creative, I think, is, is creating these kind of um, surrogate grandparenting programs, connecting uh, grandparents with grandkids who are not their own. Because again, 40% of grandparents live far away from their grandkids. So I'm gonna stop there. We have a couple more slides that I have um, that specifically have to do with the COVID crisis. But why don't we stop here and uh, talk about this data because I've kind of thrown a lot at you. We can come back to the slides about um, COVID when we have time. Okay, so I am open to questions. Thank you so much, David. Um, sure. this, this has really been, um, you've given us a lot to think about. And I think that your study um, certainly uncovers many opportunities that will help us to engage this underserved population. So um, we have a couple of questions in the chat. I'm gonna just start with, um, first, are you planning to do more research? We had a couple of questions. One about, um, is the survey ongoing? Is there a way to participate? And, and then a more specific question about why you didn't include air travel um, as a, as a criteria for, I mean, I, I assume grandparents who live more than five hours away um, would fall into that category. So um, the, um, we, the three answers to the first question about the study. The, the one is we'll, we have a lot of data that we have yet to mine. So for instance, we have data that breaks down the country into regions. So we have the capacity to compare the Midwest to the, you know, the East Coast to the West Coast in terms of all these practices. We have the capacity to, to, to um, kind of massage the data in a lot of different ways. And we'll continue to do that. And we can do that for individual organizations. I spoke to um, a synagogue in Pittsburgh yesterday and said, you know, we have data specifically for the Midwest, which by the way shows higher level of Jewish engagement than other um, parts of the country. Um, so that um, also in terms of uh, research. So we did a follow-up study of grandparenting during COVID. All of this is available on our website. And we did a non-published study where we did a series of focus groups with parents um, because we felt we hadn't really attended to the middle generation. The additional, um, the additional data that we would like to um, uh, gather is to extend the range of grandparents. You know, so we stopped at age 80 for this study, but we know that grandparenting changes depending on how old you are. Uh, and the relationship between a teenager and a grandparent is obviously profoundly different, but perhaps equally as important as the relationship with um, a toddler, let's say. Um, we, look like we need to know more about the middle generation, the parents, in terms of what's helpful, what's not helpful, and that kind of thing. So yes, we'd like to do additional research. We have, you know, the, our research also focused on the United States. You know, so I, I was speaking last week to um, a community center in Montreal, and I said, I'm sharing data, but it's really not about you. Um, so that was the first, and in terms of playing, you know, I think, um, I think our thinking was, is like, you know, what's like the, What's the schlep factor? You know, even to like get on a plane before COVID, it will say, so my grand granddaughter is in Baltimore. Okay, so it's an hour and a half flight, but you know, it's like, it's a schlep. And it's not the kind of thing if my daughter calls me up and says, listen, dad, you know, I need you to come here this afternoon because, you know, being a, as a cold and I got to go to work, I can't do that. So I think that was one of the reasons we didn't include planes. I'll tell you a really interesting story, by the way. Um, you know, not being able to travel was a big issue, obviously, during COVID. And we, so there was one, we asked grandparents, one grand set of grandparents, we asked about how often they had seen their kids. They wrote in their comment, 
they hadn't seen their kids in weeks. That's a, so they quarantined for, for a week. They rented a van, they bought a porta potty, they bought food, they bought sleeping bags, and they lived out of their van for two days going and coming and going so they could spend a week with their grandkids. So I, I think the answer to the question regarding travel is, is maybe just the schlep factor, is that, um, you know, um, like all our kids went to schools close enough that they can come and do their laundry, but not close enough that we could visit unannounced. So I think it was that notion of being close enough, you know, we could randomly go over on a Tuesday and hang out in the afternoon. And again, especially since we know that a lot of the important stuff happens at home, that's important. So I think those are those two questions. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't know what ex to what extent you've actually had experience with programs, but if so, um, can you give us some examples of successful programs? And also, um, have you seen a desire for programs where grandparents seek community programming to connect them with other grandparents, i.e. support groups, social activities, that sort of thing? Um, let me take that question first. Um, yes, we have had a number of programs. Um, so two examples. So I see that Fred Clara is on the phone. And so Fred participated in, uh, I think Marty did too. And I think uh, uh, who else did participate in the program? Sheila participated and you participated in a five part Jewish learning program. Yes. We had four grandparents, which we did in partnership with um, uh, Oroth, the Center for New Jewish uh, Learning and taught by um, Jane Shapiro. And it was a five part Jewish learning series and it was wonderful. And there was a sense of collegial collegiality uh, that, that was in that group. And I think at this point, about 50 or 60 grandparents have participated in that program. The other thing we did is um, we had a three-part program in the fall, grandparenting during COVID. And the third part was broken down into small groups. And I met with a group of grandparents who had younger kids, ages like one to three. And that group is still meeting. Uh, they meet about once every three weeks. They had never met before. So yes, there's an absolute need for grandparents to, I think in a real value in providing opportunities for grandparents to talk to one another. Um, I did a, a focus group in Seattle among parents, grandparents, and they said, you know, I moved here to be with my grandkids and I don't know anybody. <laughs> and so they were delighted that we were able to bring them together with other grandparents. So I think I think it is value. I also think in doing those kind of groups, you need to be thoughtful about who's facilitating because as we've identified, 20% of our grandparents uh, report that they are uh, wistful and that there are serious challenges in their intergenerational relationships and you just need somebody who's mindful of those complicated dynamics. Um, was there another part of that, or a successful program? Um, I, she actually, clarified, um, really thinking more in terms of programs that are meant for grandparents and their grandchildren. Um, have you? So we're actually launching um, an initiative this summer. And if anybody wants to be a part of the pilot, they, um, they could just shoot me an email um, or we can, I'll, I'll put my email in the follow-up in the material we send out. So we're piloting a program. Um, we were hoping to, um, promote innovative engagement of grandparents and grandkids uh, through virtual through the, you know uh, virtual communication we know that post uh, that the number of grandparents who are communicating with their grandkids through video communication has doubled since the beginning of covid so it's now a medium that we older folks can know how to use um, but we also know that it's like very two dimensional and so we're creating a program to make it much more interactive. So we're having a program this weekend, for instance, where the Israeli artist Hanoch Piven is gonna be working with a group of grandparents and grandkids together on the phone uh, on a program called um, What Families Are Made Of, where he'll be teaching families, grandparents and grandkids, how to make family portraits out of stuff that they find around the house buttons and paper clips and da da da. And Hanoch Piven is a famous Israeli artist. So 
if folks want to be part of that program, part of the either the programs coming up or part of the pilot, which we're calling the family room, uh, just shoot me an email and I will include you. So in terms of creating programs um, for grandparents and grandkids, first of all, they have to be fun, you know, um, and so it can't, you know, we have to be just thoughtful about what's going to capture a grandkid's imagination. And obviously it varies. You're not going to have a program for a three-year-old that's going to be suitable um, for a 12-year-old. We're having a program today, with, uh, we're having a call today or tomorrow with an organization called, um, uh, what is it called? Lost Tribe. And there it's a Jewish platform that encourages teens and tweens to get together in gaming through a Jewish medium. So they're playing mind, whatever the games that they play. And we're actually talking with them about how grandparents can learn about gaming. So, so and there are games that might be appropriate for grandparents and grandkids to get to play together. So um, uh, that's some of the things that we're doing. Um, and we're trying to find a way to kind of create a home environment uh, virtually. And again, anybody who wants to be part of that preview or any of the two program, shoot me an email and we'll send you an invite. Okay, I'm gonna ask two more questions and then I'll let you go back to your the rest of your slides. One is just the um, added sensitivity of being a grandparent when your adult child is in an interfaith relationship or marriage. And the second question is, what have you learned in all of this that has surprised you the most? Um, well, I'll kind of link the questions. Um, um, you know, I grew up, uh, I'm a Salma Shekhtar school kid, Camp Rama kid, you know, minor. So I'm a conservative Jew from way back. And when I was in Salma Shakhtar, I remember they showed us a video. Um, it wasn't a video because they didn't have video when I was in Salma Shakhtar, a movie. Uh, and it started out with the man going through all the Jewish activities from morning, covering his mirror, you know, tearing his clothes, da, da, da. and the last scene was his daughter getting married in a church. So having a child intermarry was like the equivalent to, you know, going to mourning. Um, and we've discovered a couple of things that have changed my thinking. Um, without question, and, you know, we may get some pushback from members of the community on this, but this is what I think, my feeling. Um, obviously, multi-faith and multiracial families are increasingly part of Jewish life today. Um, but we've seen an incredible richness that those families can bring to Jewish life. Um, and when they bring their own traditions and mix it with ours, it kind of can elevate our traditions. Um, we've discovered, again, as I mentioned earlier, that parents don't, by and large, they don't sign a contract from the beginning saying, this is how our kids are gonna be raised. Life really isn't like that. Uh, and part of what we hear from grant from parents is that they're figuring it out as they go. Um, Christmas tree, not Christmas tree, that is, you know, Hebrew school, not Hebrew school. But I think if we as a grandparents and a community can engage them in a Jewish life that's meaningful and rich and joyful, then they will embrace Jewish life. Um, and those folks who come to our families um, from not Jewish traditions can elevate, can provide additional meaning if we welcome them. We will send you in the follow-up material, a wonderful article by a gentleman named uh, Roger Talbot. And I'll just have to remember to do that. Roger is a member of our advisory committee. He's a retired Methodist minister whose son converted to Judaism and married a rabbi. So his machatanim, he's a minister. His machatanim are, are, is a rabbi. Um, uh, and he talks about how we kind of welcome people to our table. How do you welcome, when people come into your home, how do you welcome them? How do you greet them? 
you know, there's an element of hachnasat orchim, welcoming guests here. And I think that's something we think of. So to me, the biggest surprise has been the change in my attitude in terms of multi-faith families um, and the richness that they could bring um, to our, our community. That's great. Um, we have about seven minutes left, so I'd like to turn it back over to you to um, look at a couple more slides and then we can close it out. Well, I'm gonna, maybe before, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna tell a parable and instead of looking at the slides. I heard this story on one of my meditation channels, but it, it kind of makes me think about Jewish life and grandparents' role in it. So I heard a story about a very famous baker. I think he was associated with Green's restaurant in um, San Francisco. And he was a kind of an internationally renowned baker. And um, he decided he wanted to make biscuits like he used to have when he was, he had this amazing memory of biscuits when he was growing up. And so he pulled out all his recipe books and came up with all these different, you know, um, new recipes for biscuits. And none of the ones biscuits he made satisfied him. None of them really kind of reminded him of what it was like when he was a kid. Until somebody at the restaurant tried the biscuits and said, these are the most amazing biscuits that I've ever had. They're, they're extraordinary. And he, you know, they, he put them out and people loved them. And um, he remembered that growing up when he had biscuits, it was either the Pillsbury, you know, those that came in the tube and you cut them in sections and you put them in the oven or the biscuit where you add milk and an egg and that's, and so we say that these are not the Jewish families we thought we would have 40 years ago. You know, Lee Henwood, my co-partner, never imagined she would have three kids who are intermarried. Um, but that doesn't mean that they're not, they can't be wonderful. Um, that maybe the biscuits that we end up with are far more delicious than the ones that we thought we would have. And I think both grandparents and uh, organizations have that responsibility or opportunity to make you know, Judaism as kind of enriching and meaningful and joyful as we can. Um, and that our multi-faith families will add to that richness. So I, I just like that parable. So we can, you know, if there are any other questions, we could take it from there. Um, let me let me just say thank you to David and to Marty and Sheila and Donna and the council staff. Um, today is the long awaited beginning to what we see as a significant expansion of the council's work in engaging grandparents and seniors in the year ahead. I want to mention the formation of a WJC roundtable around these ideas and resources and other future programs that will be targeted to this vital cohort. Um, you can join the Council's mailing list at wjcouncil.org to stay informed. And you can also visit the Jewish Grandparents website, which is just jewishgrandparentsnetwork.org to see more of the study findings and to explore the many resources that are offered there. Um, before I just thank you all again for joining us, I want to invite our CEO of the Westchester Jewish Council, Elliot Forsheimer, to say a few words. Hi, everybody. I just really want to say, say thank you. Time is so precious. And um, on this actually kind of cloudy day that you spend time together is wonderful. And thanks for staying on. A, a very few people left to go and have lunch in, in the middle. As Lisa mentioned, um, today's the beginning. And uh, we're going to spend the next couple of months over the summertime hearing from you as specifically what kind of help you want so that we can all, all do better. That's all, um, it's what it's about. I do want to thank Marty and David for giving us a lot of background. We have to build the foundation before we build the building. So today was about building the foundation. How we go ahead will be up to you. So stay in touch. Thanks Lisa for sharing this. And thanks Sheila Friedland, a good friend, my predecessor in this role and this seat, but in a different office, it was down the road. And um, thanks of course to the council staff. Have a wonderful afternoon, a great day. 
Shabbat Shalom. We'll be in touch. Don't be shy. Thank Thanks. you, guys. Thanks so much. Cool to Terrific.